Okay, here we are with uh, Marcus from Strong Not Starving. Marcus, great to have you on the podcast today to talk about the real strategies to overcoming uh, binge eating, something that you've got a lot of personal experience with, and uh, both in terms of your previous lifestyle uh, and your coaching as well. So before we get into it, do you want to just tell the audience a bit about who you are, what it is that you do now? Sure thing. Thanks for having me, Johnny. It's good to see you again here, man. Um, so my journey with binge eating started off as a much more severe eating disorder. I went down a rabbit hole in my teenage years as a result of a lot of pressure in things like school sport and body image and everything like that when I was getting body composition tests at a very young age in the name of performing better in my school sporting environment, which was very competitive. It very quickly stopped being about the sport and started becoming about physical appearance that led into um, what can only be described as anorexia. I met all the diagnostic criteria for anorexia that then transitioned into bulimia. And then my pathway out of bulimia involved many years when I was no longer purging and compensating, mm -hmm. but I was still binging. And it was a messy process because when I say I was no longer purging and compensating from, from binges, there was still, you know, restriction. There was still sometimes compensation in the form of exercise. So some people might say that still classifies as bulimia. And I guess technically it does. But the mm -hmm. transition from anorexia to bulimia to binge eating disorder was not clean cut. It was not like in June, I was struggling with bulimia and then July, it became binge eating disorder. These things are messy. And yeah, yeah and that, that led me as well on this kind of professional crusade within the health and wellness space. When I first got into the health and wellness space in my early 20s, I started off as a remedial massage therapist because I, I wanted to do something with my hands. I wanted to help people. I wanted to do sports massage. I wanted to be involved in sport and performance and everything. And I started to think as I was working with people and treating people like so many of these problems and pain that, that people were experiencing that just wouldn't be here if we were maybe taking care of ourselves a bit better. And from there, I was like, okay, I'm going to become a personal trainer. So right. I became, became a personal trainer, started working with people in terms of their physical health and movement and everything. And just constantly people were coming to me about weight loss, not feeling happy in their body, struggles with food. And as many personal trainers experience, I was brought to this kind of crossroads where I was like, the problem isn't in the gym. People are struggling with food so much. Why? Why? Like what's going on with food? So then I became a nutrition coach, still pulling on this thread of, of finding the source, like finding the original problem, like the original crime scene. And then through being a nutrition coach, I was realizing that all these really wonderful, intelligent people that I was working with who had all this like discipline and focus and strength in all their other areas of their lives would often find themselves struggling so much with food and making food choices that they just weren't proud of. And that made me wonder what's going on there, like what's happening there. And that made me reflect on my own relationship with food and what was going on there as well. So I started to educate myself more and do some official upskilling in terms of being disordered eating and eating disorder informed and binge eating informed. And I kind of accidentally fell into the role of being an eating disorder recovery coach. And I've spent many years doing that at this point, but ironically, more and more as I become, as I get more and more years under my belt doing that job, I'm seeing that it comes down to stress management more than anything else, like how we deal with life's stresses uh, in a very three dimensional way, whether it be physical stress, emotional stress, environmental stress, psychological stress, all the different kinds of stresses and how those kind of things play out in our lives. And, you know, in terms of the role that, say, restriction, dietary restriction might play in binge eating, we, it might be easy to say that, okay, uh, restriction leads to binge eating. So, all right, but what leads to the restriction? What, what is the stressor that we think we're 
going to solve by engaging in, say, a diet that is overly restrictive? So mm. it's these these kind of questions that have led me to where I am now. Yeah, like I think, as you mentioned, your history of of where you came from then into the well-being industry of I want to help people out and a lot of people came to you unhappy with how they look and wanting nutrition to solve that you you're then then like okay well I need to help people with their food intake and that's sort of the the first rung on the ladder that we all think of right we're like well this is the, the you know it's the issue is we're doing something wrong with food and it's easy to look at that through a binge eating lens as well of like well it's something I'm doing with my food because I'm I'm having these un, you know uh, uncontrollable urges to eat large amounts of food for some reason often in secret associated with a lot of shame um and it's this whole so i must be having a food issue whereas as you can see like when you look through the ladder it's like well that maybe there's a restriction issue that's leading to this overcompensation and this uncontrollable urge but what's leading the restriction yeah what's what's the stressor or what's the desire and you know it's interesting you're saying well i'm coming at this from a stress and you know a stressor point of view stress management point of view and i i would come at it from a kind of body image point of view and both are both are right it's like they're both prongs that that happen but often people will still in their head when they first think about having an issue they're like it's because i don't you know i don't i'm doing something wrong with food or i i have this issue that i want solving whereas it's a lot deeper than that um from a kind of core issue point of view yeah, absolutely. Something that like I've had the priv privilege of knowing you for quite a few years now and something that I've noticed about the parallels in our work, we're often talking about the same thing and using different words. Mm. So when you say body image, I agree. Like the the challenge that most people struggling with binge eating face to some degree is body image. It is almost ubiquitously across the board with everyone I work with who's struggling with body image. There might be one or two people I've worked with where emotional dysregulation is the mm -hmm. key is the key player and body image is, you know, further down on the list. But for the vast majority of people, body image is a, a major player. And I've started to, in my own work, maybe just to streamline my own mental process a little bit, started to label body image as a stressor so yeah. it's a, a psychological and emotional stressor and if we deal with that stressor effectively mm. it's going to give us more wiggle room to deal with the binge eating yeah and i think incorporating that into stressor and saying about coping with stress managing stress you you reach people then don't you by the case of them saying well yeah you know like i am I am stressed and a lot of stuff's going on and that's why I'm I'm binge eating because I'm using it as a coping mechanism. And so it's a really great route in from a, a language point of view that people can understand and, and, and resonate with. And then you are therefore able to help them, right? Because that's, that's what marketing all comes down to is using the language that people use to therefore show you, them how you can help them. Taking it back to your own story, how did you, because obviously you talked about the blending patterns of eating disorders and this is where diagnostic criteria can let people down right is yeah you actually match that that criteria for for a certain you, you know um specific eating disorder but therefore you have the symptoms and quite heavy symptoms of, of disordered eating and your sort of anorexia blended into sort of bulimia and, and binge eating still kind of came out the other end even after the compensation had gone how did you eventually get on top of that binge eating what were the what were the strategies that you used or the framework that you used or the the mindset shift if you will or or the combination of all of the above that helped you to the other side it was a messy process and the first step i can say that a pivotal key in the first step was working with someone who was willing to meet me where i was at like my first step in overcoming binge eating I didn't realize that I was overcoming binge eating. I just knew that something was very, very wrong with my strategy. I knew that I'd been banging my head against a wall for a really long time and it wasn't working. It wasn't delivering me the promised result that I was under the impression that I was going to get if I ticked these boxes and did this specific work. And I got so frustrated and reached out to a, a trusted 
mentor, like trusted coach. And he was not really a, a binge eating recovery coach or anything like that. He was just an older guy in the fitness industry who'd walked the path, who'd been there and done it. He wasn't a therapist. He wasn't a counselor, but he understood where I was coming from. He understood what I wanted. He understood why I wanted the things that I wanted. He understood the journey and he made me feel like I was being listened to. And that was an experience that I hadn't had previously when I was maybe going to uh, therapy for eating disorders and that kind of stuff. I know there are a lot of great therapists out there, absolutely. But when I went to therapy, and nothing against therapy, I'm an advocate of therapy. But when I went to therapy and I was describing what I was dealing with in terms of disordered eating, the reaction that I got I can only describe as them kind of saying like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? That's just silly. And so I needed to actually talk to someone who really understood why, who really understood and had been down that road. And I felt that I could then trust him. I could trust this guy with his advice because he was telling me, look, I know what you want. I know you want to be a better athlete. I know you want to do these things. I know you want to be in less pain. Um, let's like the first one of the first things he said to me was look mate you need a feed you you you'd like you because i was restricting and then binging and then restricting and then binging he was like mate come on like if you're going to be training in the way that you want to be training we, you got to feed yourself better and in all the years of therapy and psychoanalysis and everything like that this was the moment when that message coming from someone who i knew understood the journey and I knew was listening to me, that was the first kind of pivotal point, I guess. And from there, incremental changes started to happen. And you'd describe them, I guess, as habituation of the foods that I'd previously considered binge triggers. Yeah, okay. Really interesting then, that mindset shift. As you said, there was the combination of the empathetic listening, understanding, appreciating where you are no belittling at all yeah. or lack of compassion or lack of understanding or sort of sense of like, well, come on, you know, why would you do that to yourself? Like none of that. Yeah. It was pure understanding and empathy and being like, totally understand why you do that. Totally know where you're coming from. However, I know that this is a goal of yours. And so it was the, it was the link to performance for yourself. That was the shift of, okay, I need to feed myself better. Yeah. Were there any body composition hangups for you at that time? Was there any fear of weight gain? and fear of what that might that, that would do to you to be like, well, I need to feed myself better. Or was it purely a, well, I'm going to feed myself better for performance. And so I don't care what's going to happen to my body as a result of that. That's an interesting one. And I don't remember that being such a massive concern at the time, purely because of just how much what I had been doing wasn't working. Like I was truly at a point where i was willing to try whatever someone i trusted suggested because despite the fact i was still hung up on wanting my body composition a certain way i was acutely aware that the way in which i had been going about it was just not working after a decade or more of just sweating and hustling and trying and being stuck in this cycle i was not where i wanted to be and i was like 10 years is probably enough to know whether or not this strategy works <laughs> and that's really what it came down to for me i was like how long have i been doing this how long have i been banging my head against a wall and i was just willing to to be open to the idea that something else was going to serve me better and it there was like a leap of faith but i was i was in so much pain physically and psychologically that at that point in time i was thinking look anything has got to be better than what i'm doing right now yeah it makes a lot of sense so it was more of a you've got nothing to lose yeah and this this hasn't been working for you yeah so it's time to try a different approach, particularly through because of the pain 
that this is causing and the, the discomfort that this is causing, you know, psychologically, physically, emotionally. Yeah. And to move out of that through that recovery phase, I know, cause you were like, you know, I can't quite remember the intention of, of, of body composition, but were there ever points on your journey where you would like to say, well, man, you know, I've not binged for a while, so I've earned one, you know, and I, you'd self-sabotage. And if so, how did you manage that? Cause I think a lot of times people, they can get stuck in the sort of stupid, um habit literature can't they of like building a streak and being like oh fucked it fuck my yeah streak. so I've, I'm, I'm back in the i'm back in the binge pattern now and they're almost they're so all or nothing with it they're either not binging and they're binge free or they have one binge and they're like well i'm a binge eater again now you know yeah. how do you deal with that so one question i guess it's two questions one did you ever self-sabotage by going i've, I've earned one because i've not had one for a while and then two how did you manage that First of all, I love the fact that you mentioned streaks. I would say in moving away from binge eating, the idea of the streak is really unhelpful. Yeah. I do my best these days to say something's not good or bad. It's either helpful or unhelpful in regards to the desired outcome. So mm -hmm. the streak mentality might be really good in other areas. Like if we're helping a kid to stop wetting the bed, a streak is a great thing but it's it's not it's it's not something that is helpful when it comes to making our way out of binge eating and the reason why i never found myself going like oh i've been good for so long now i can you know treat myself and have that go off the rails is because i was including quote binge foods in manageable ways on literally a daily basis. I completely let go of the idea of clean day, cheat day, binge mm -hmm. day, bad day, good day. Mm -hmm. It was truly a, a practice of bringing that habituation of different foods back in. And I know that's a really scary and intimidating idea for a lot of people, but doing that allowed me to regulate my consumption of these foods in a more peaceful way because if i ever found myself picking up momentum towards something that would resemble a binge i was able to say genuinely and mean it it's okay i can stop eating this right now because this same thing will be available for me tomorrow if i want it tomorrow this is not a big deal this is not the kind of situation where as of tomorrow i'm going to be on another streak and trying not to eat this food ever again mm. if everything i did was taking these foods off these pedestals yeah removing the guilt removing the shame removing that streak mentality and just being like i've i've had as much as i would like to have today um i don't feel sick I don't feel bad from this experience because anyone who knows what it's like to binge, you'll know the first few bites are great, but then it just becomes this hellscape after a while. Mm. So being able to say, you know what? I'm good. I'm done. I've had enough and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not panicking because I can have this again tomorrow if I want and it's not a big deal. Paradoxically, that allowed me to start regulating the amount of these foods that i was eating much much easier than trying to be on a streak right yeah it makes more makes a lot of sense so really you were using unconditional permission to eat as a way to help you prevent binge eating because it wasn't like a last opportunity for you to eat these foods yeah yeah what would you say to somebody who was using unconditional permission to eat as an excuse to binge to say well i could i've got unconditional permission to eat so fuck it let's go I would say that unconditional permission is a practice and a skill set, not a statement to be taken literally. Like the philosophy of unconditional permission is about the removal of shame and guilt. It's not about impulsively eating. I've said this in my content a few times that um, unconditional permission to eat is not unconditioned to like is not permission to make careless impulsive choices yeah so if unconditional permission is going wrong for someone 
what my questions are is what what is the spanner that is being thrown into the works there mm. is there are there still high amounts or high degrees of guilt and shame and stress are you giving yourself unconditional permission but still treating it like a this is a this is a treat and i'm gonna be good tomorrow or mm. are you giving yourself quote unconditional permission but feeling guilty and an anxious like every moment that you're eating there is a massive emotional regulation and mindset um component of of unconditional permission and i know a lot of people have quote bad experiences with unconditional permission because they're like oh it just leads to binge eating and as blunt as it might sound i'll be like that's because you there might be pieces of the formula missing for you in that case yeah yeah, yeah. good 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 points particularly the impulsive eating piece because mm -hmm. a lot of people resort to that uh, unconditional permission to eat right intuitive eating i'm just gonna eat wherever i want all the time and it's like well that's impulsive eating yes it's a very, it's a very different thing mm -hmm. uh, and as you said then it's not it's not it's not an excuse it's not it's not a it's not a permission slip it's not a pass go collect 200 and you know take the binge as you go type of thing it's a case of it's 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 you need to use it the other way around as you said right you you actually use it as a way to say that, like what what are you doing this for right you can yeah. have these foods whenever you want like and and it's not a need for you therefore to put yourself in this position where you're so uncomfortably full um and 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 bloated um a question I have for you is that, you know, you mentioned about stresses and stress management, and I, I want to move on to that after this specific question. But so when people have the urge to binge, a, a technique that we've all heard of is that surfing the urge, right? You know, like allowing the wave to crash over you and, and sitting in that kind of discomfort. But what if, what if in that moment, you know of the techniques, right? You've had the therapy, you've, you've read the, the articles, you know, you've listened to our podcasts on the matter you're like you know you know the technique but you just don't do it you're like i'd rather binge right now i want to i want to binge how do you pull yourself into that position to successfully surf the urge and and, and kind of choose the choose choose the move that's going to be better for you in that moment rather than the away move two big concepts one kind of simpler than the other come to mind as the first port of call that i ask people about and give them space to chat about when addressing this topic. The first one is, is there still some form of restriction present? Because trying to surf the urge when we are genuinely physiologically hungry, we can't surf away genuine hunger. Also, if we are restricting food groups and the food that we're eating is not really living, leaving us feeling satiated and satisfied, then that's going to be a difficult urge to surf away because it's based in like a physiological satiety type, you know, it's based in a need that's going unmet. Mm. We want to be aware of unmet needs mm. when urge surfing. And this is why when people like, oh, I, I did the insert random diet here that doesn't allow me to eat X, Y, Z foods, and mm. I'm trying to surf the urge, it's like, mm. oh, that's going to be a really dicey, like, because there's going to, we're talking unmet needs. Yeah. Like, there might be a, whether we think it's logical or not, like, oh, surely I could survive without bread. Well, you know, our subconscious and our psychological landscape doesn't quite work like that. You know, the, everything holds meaning for us, and especially a multifaceted, um, sensory experience like eating that's tied to our emotions and history and all this kind of stuff we need to allow ourselves to think a bit more three-dimensionally about what restriction is and what unmet needs are trying to surf away an urge that's tied to a need that's gone unmet really mm -hmm. rough also secondary a slightly bigger topic is the topic of meaning and fulfillment mm -hmm. when i'm talking about unmet needs Often I find myself working with people who are ticking all the boxes in their life, working hard, taking care of their family. But when it comes to what we could call existential stress, mm -hmm. meaning, fulfillment, 
some people might call it spirituality, there is a deep lack of it. There is like this lack of meaning, this lack of fulfillment. There is lack of a reason to really engage with something like urge surfing beyond just like, I don't want to binge because I like don't want to put on weight or I want to look good in summer or I feel sick when I binge or whatever. Like mm -hmm. what real reason do we have to engage in the uncomfortable process that is urge surfing in the name of making different choices? And if our only reason is tied to something that we feel we need to be out of a sense of obligation to fit into society, that's not going to be a deep enough reason for us to do these things. When I talk about fulfillment and meaning and the reason why we're showing up and engaging in any of this stuff, it's like mm. your reason has to be selfish. It mm. has to be yours. It has to mean a lot to you. And often parents really struggle with this because they say things like, I feel like I should be able to make healthy choices so that I can be healthy for my kids. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that is really honorable and that is wonderful. And it's clear that you love your kids, mm. but something in this, it needs to be for you, just yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And uh, there, there are so many great things of what you said there, Marcus, of like what, what are the unmet needs in this position right that you're because you're getting this urge to binge so what what are the unmet needs and it could be a restriction or it could be something else entirely um and then understanding what your desire is on the other side of this right why, why do you want to stop binge eating what like what's it truly for and knowing that that is a, a really strong motivator and and not one that's born of that kind of societal pressure of of body standards you know as, as we've spoken about before and i think that's the when you said is this a restriction that's causing the the desire to binge right you're like i can live without bread and it's like wait well, you can but do you do you truly want to you know just because some some dickhead on social media is told you that bad for you and bread's the reason why you're gaining weight it's like it's not a reason for you to then cut it out of your life and it's not a lack of willpower that you can't keep away from bread it's not a lack of discipline it's not a personal failing it's the fact that restriction affects everybody differently and if it's affecting your satisfaction you're now just not enjoying your food and if you're not enjoying your food well then the urge to binge is going to get greater because you're crying out for that that satisfaction that desire and i think that's where because one of the questions i get from clients is well where does this where does this fit you know even though i'm you know quite quite weight neutral by this point in terms of the way that i work and i talk a lot more about body image and body confidence and you know having a great relationship with food you know people say to me but what if i want to lose fat and and what if my f desire for fat loss is pure vanity's sake and my answer to that would be well it's probably then leading to some form of restriction and it's lead and you know it's a restriction that's born out of a societal beauty standard rather than for any you know purpose of health and it's kind of feeding the flame of the binge I would argue, kind of doesn't really feel like it could be one that's paralleled, although I'm interested to hear your take. Most people who come to me are invested in one way or another in their body size and shape. And what I find most helpful these days is to acknowledge everything that you just said is true with societal pressures and all these kind of things it's it's really helpful to ask okay we might want this but why do we want this like let let's look at psychological social conditioning all that kind of stuff but at the end of the day i might have that conversation with someone and they're like yeah but you know what i still want it i i still want to change my body size and shape and then we kind of start the conversation of okay let's look at what's helpful and what's not helpful regardless of what you think someone else is doing or regardless of what someone else says they're doing if engaging in a process that hits your subconscious as restrictive is resulting in binge eating then it's not congruent with your goal if we want to have some autonomy in terms of body size and shape 
we need to be really focused on your unique experience and what's really what's helpful and what's unhelpful forget what other people are doing forget what you've seen on social media what practices what things have you done that have led to binge eating and stress and struggles with food and what practices have you done that have led to a stable relationship with food where you feel like you have more power to choose so developing that connection between the difference between an active mindful choice and feeling compelled to do something when you choose a food when you choose to eat something are you choosing it because it's a choice that you have autonomy over and that you're making in that moment or are you making a choice because you feel driven and compelled like someone else is at the steering wheel this is the kind of territory that we need to go in in terms of body size and shape and i like to use hollywood as an example because i'd say to most people if i put you on a wonderful desert island somewhere with this team of like chefs and personal trainers and private massage therapists and you had no responsibilities other than to eat nice food exercise treat yourself well be surrounded by like 10 of your favorite people all the time you had none of the responsibilities that you have none of the stresses that you currently have in your currently life i i bet you could make some changes you know i bet you would come out of that looking different but at the end of the day if the balance of stresses in our life is driving us towards coping mechanisms rather than active choices or mindful choices then it's useless trying to engage in some kind of restrictive diet or some kind of band-aid that promises a change in our body size or shape because we're always going to be driven back to those um, coping strategies because the stress isn't handled well and it's worth saying as a caveat here i've had clients who have started to use things like ozempic and experienced no fucking weight loss like i just want to make that really clear that we can look at the fact that there are things that we can do to manage stress and potentially create a larger degree of autonomy in terms of our body size and shape but that still has no guarantees like it's not my job to tell people whether or not they should or shouldn't go for surgery or weight loss medications or whatever so some people coming to me if they go on something like ozempic or whatever i'm like this is what i know about it but i'm not your doctor i would just want anyone listening to know that i've literally had people on this wonder drug prescribed by their doctor and experience zero change in their weight so sure there might be some things that we can do if we're willing to invest our energy in helpful areas rather than unhelpful areas but that still doesn't mean that the result is entirely up to us yeah yeah that's a really great point because people react differently to different things and i think mm. that's the the key message that goes out there right that's why i hate the advertisements that are out there to be like hey just do this and you'll get this result or like hey just eat like me or train yeah. like you and you'll get this result hey just take this wonder drug and you'll get these results like as you said and i'll I'll say this as well like i've worked with people on glp1 medication and you still need to do the deep work on your relationship with food and the relationship with your body like that that stuff doesn't change like i yeah. was a guy who was seeing visible weight loss but was still talking you know talking to himself like shit in the mirror yeah and still, you know still had quite bad um case of of fat phobia toward other people you know so his internal weight stigma was bad his weight stigma to others was bad he still had that kind of judgmental attitude and we had to work on those things because otherwise it didn't matter the weight he lost he still wouldn't have you know been happy with himself and confident in his body because those are those are deeper things and so like like what you said you know a restrictive diet or a coping me mechanism are just band-aids for these types of things and so if you're 
wanting to lose body fat, but it's coming purely from a, a place of vanity. You know, it's likely that you're you're doing overly restrictive things, and that's creating a kind of a fuel for that binge. Particularly then, if you don't see the weight loss that you want to see, and that's all that it's about. You know, it's that whole like, oh well, you were never going to lose that weight by that time anyway, so fuck it, you might as well binge. Or oh well, you've not lost any weight despite trying hard, fuck it, you might as well binge. Yeah. Or then it's even the whole like, you you go for a binge and then you weigh yourself and you, you know, you however many pounds up because of the added food and the added salt the added water retention the carbohydrate storage the water retention from carbohydrate storage and you're like oh fuck i fucked everything up i'm trying to lose weight why am i so shit and then you have another binge and yeah. it's just a, a really destructive cycle yeah categorically unhelpful like in every way <laughs> in every way and i think i lean on these words so much now after years spent in the you know in and out of like the anti-diet space and all these other things and because there are so many different subjective experiences and such a wide varied range of experiences with food and body shape and you know it doesn't take long to find exceptions to every single rule quote rule out there mm. so these days yeah, I very much pose that question when someone comes to me with something, either this, that, whatever. I'm like, based on your experience, is that helpful or unhelpful? And I'm glad you mentioned about beliefs because, you know, when it comes to things like even how we think about stress, uh, our beliefs alter our physiology. So this does not mean that if we have a positive mindset, we will never lead, like we never need to sleep and can live on Doritos and look like a cover model. That's like, there are limits to how much beliefs can influence our physiology. Mm -hmm. But with things like stress, for example, and different hormonal reactions within the body, our beliefs matter. So mm -hmm. if we are going around talking to ourselves like crap, treating ourselves really badly. If the desire is fat loss, whatever, um, talking to yourself like shit is actually an obstacle to that. Mm. It's, it's not congruent with the result that you're after, even if that is the result. Ironically, like... Yeah, there are just so many things that are encouraged by the fitness industry and that whole discipline and go hard and hate yeah. yourself until you get there. It doesn't it doesn't help. It doesn't in help. No, I think oh. like the toxic masculinity fitness culture has a lot to answer for that, particularly with the amount of guys I speak to who suffer with binge eating and suffer with that that shame that surrounds it as well and, and the shame around their size and weight, which often lead to those things mm. because it's that whole like, you know, if you don't, have a six pack then you're clearly ill disciplined right you know those videos you see of like well i wouldn't hire someone who what didn't have a six pack because i wouldn't work with someone who didn't have a six pack because it clearly shows me yeah they're proper jerk offs you know then they're, they're clearly ill disciplined they don't have the willpower right i commented on somebody even in the property investment space they were like i wouldn't work with someone who was overweight because it shows me they don't have the willpower and so why would i want someone in business like that and i'm like you sound like a complete tosser and you clearly yeah. are um and I won't, you know, won't call him out on the show, but it's like, as you said, the way that we talk to ourselves matters, right? So if you are your own worst enemy, that's adding a lot of stress. And mm. we've seen within behavior change that stigma and shame doesn't lead to conducive behavior. So it's not going to lead to that behavior to yourself. And as you said, there's a limit to what our body can do from a as you said, from a physiological response from our self-talk. But if we're talking to ourselves in a better way, we're more likely to eat in a way that matches our values. You mentioned eating for performance as a key way for you to manage your binge eating at the time. And that's something to be said with regards to, you know, if you're looking for some form of body composition change, okay, it can't be the hill that you die on because your body will react differently to other people. But if yeah. you feed yourself adequately and you exercise in a certain way and you do all those things from a place of, self-respect and self-care as opposed to fat loss and muscle gain by any means necessary then you could potentially see a muscle gain you could potentially see then a body composition shift because of those things and if you do that alongside all of this other work 
you're then going to be in a much better place mentally and physically. Totally. I couldn't have said it better myself. The difficult thing I found with that is the saying like, okay, 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 cool. So if I don't prioritize my physical appearance and instead I train for performance, feeling good, all that kind of stuff, then you're telling me that there's a higher likelihood that I'll experience the physical change. but the, And it's almost like we're saying on the outside, yeah, I'm doing this for my health, but really it it's driven, still driven from that place of like, oh, but, but really what I want is, is to look different. And there's mm. the body checking and the, the am I there yet mentality. And yeah. we really need to get a handle on that. Something that sounds kind of blunt, but is one of the key messages that I give to people again in the most compassionate way. Don't fucking kid yourself. Yeah. Like, don't kid yourself about the reasons why you're doing this because your subconscious knows you cannot lie to yourself. It's like with the whole unconditional permission thing. If, mm. if we really would like to have fish and chips with our partner or our kids or something like that, and we try to say, oh, you know what? It doesn't actually matter. I'm just going to have like a chicken salad because I can have fish and chips tomorrow if I want to. And we're yeah. kind of <laughs> <laughs> saying that through just like white knuckling it with gritted teeth. You can't lie to yourself yeah. like that. Like, so yeah, don't, don't kid yourself. You can uh, lie to your coach. You can lie to your friends. You can lie to other people and we might believe you, but you won't. And that's what's yeah. important. Yeah, I think that's a key thing to look out for, as you said, is the opposite of unconditional permission to eat, which is like your family are going for fish and chips after a nice day at the beach, but you're like, well, I can have it at any time. So instead, I'm going to choose a salad because I really want one. You're like, don't be a jerk off. Like, you know, <laughs> don't lie. It's, it's, like, it's the opportunity is there. You're at the beach. You've had a great day. Everyone wants fish and chips. Like, the, the moment is to say, great well this is the time to have it because i'm going to enjoy a, a nice moment with my family and okay i might be craving a chicken salad but really it's not an opportune moment to have one and i can have one at any time it's like it works both ways yeah um, and, and and so i'm glad that i'm glad that you said that because that, that is very funny um it's but but sad not funny in that like we're not laughing at you if you do that because we've both been there but it's yes. like that's you know you do need to be aware of, of how your mind can play tricks on you in that regard and and what i wanted to pull on just briefly before we moved on to the next um query was what you said about like the are we there yet the body checking and and uh, you know that's why i'm so big on that in terms of weighing yourself and checking yourself out in the mirror and tensing and posing and pulling on bits because it never leads to a good decision and and often it's that whole well i've been trying this but i'm still not losing weight so clearly this isn't working either it's like you're putting all of the, the eggs into the out into the physical outcome bucket rather than into the well what's the the healthiest way for me to eat and live my lifestyle um which has nothing to do with how much you weigh mm, true so pulling on to that um because you've mentioned so many times about stress management you're like you know there's unmet needs there's stresses going on so how do you get to the because we spoke about well the unmet need might be the fact that you fucking hate the food you're eating and so you need to focus on satisfaction but what about if it's something else like how do you go about figuring that out that's a, a real process of self-discovery and honesty and there are some situations where like for example a gentleman that i work with he has chosen a safe job that best supports his family. He's supporting his, his wife and two little ones. And he doesn't find his job mind-blowingly exciting. And he's going through a phase in his life where he doesn't have a whole lot of access to the kinds of things that used to really make him feel like him, like the outdoor activities, the sport, the everything like that. So his balance of responsibilities to outlets is a bit screwed at the moment and that in terms of unmet needs and fulfillment and everything that's a really difficult place to be and that's just one example of the different kinds of situations that we can find ourselves in but it's going to be unique for everyone and it's going to be a challenge but this is 
why sometimes I yak on about things like fulfillment and having a bit of a vision for somewhere that you're going and something that you're shooting towards. I don't believe that it's possible for literally every single person on earth to become a billionaire and own a yacht. Like that's not what I'm saying at all, but that's not really what fulfillment and meaning and meeting unmet, unmet needs means for most people. So when we look at how to create the most fulfilling version of our life possible while acknowledging that there is a step-by-step -step process to get there knowing that we're taking steps to get there and, and knowing that we're making progress that we can see things happening that's part of it unmet needs that come from a very emotional place often challenges with communication come mm -hmm. into play here if someone doesn't feel safe communicating or if they're not in an environment where they can you know communicate with the the people that they love about their needs and 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 what they need while making sure that everyone else is kind of happy too and that it's a good team situation mm -hmm. sometimes communication and working on communication can be the call i've worked with plenty of people who come to me for health, nutrition, fitness, all that kind of stuff. And we end up spending a lot of time talking about communication because yeah. the big barrier for them doing what they want to do is, is the fact that they, they struggle to communicate what they need and what they want and how they want to show up in their relationships. My wife is a fantastic relationship coach and she had a really good example of this the other day where say so someone was very introverted and they needed a lot more time to themselves mm -hmm. than, than their partner. Their partner just wanted to be together all the time, doing stuff together all the time, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And this slightly more introverted person didn't feel confident having that conversation. So they were always letting their own needs kind of be swept under the rug and showing up always in their partner's company, always doing this kind of stuff. Uh, despite the fact that their own needs were going unmet, it, they weren't able to recover from the stress of their day-to-day -day life. Their cup mm -hmm. wasn't being filled. In order to approach that situation, it wasn't a case of saying like, you know, don't be such a prick. I need more time to myself. Yeah. You know, you're not letting me do what I want to do, whatever. It was a case of being able to say like, I really want to show up in this marriage as the best version of myself. I mm -hmm. really want to show up in this marriage together with you. I want to be fully present when we do things together. Mm -hmm. And in order to be that guy, in order to do that, I need a certain amount of time where I just kind of like decompress and recharge in order to show up as the husband that I want to be when we are together. Yeah. So that's just a couple of examples of how identifying where needs might be going unmet mm. i'm into this whole scenario and and that's a very personal and unique journey and everyone is going to have a slightly different conversation about that but it starts with the honesty and the self-awareness like what what might i need that i'm not currently getting especially when am i responding to that unmet need with food and mm when is food playing the role of the silver medal to what i really want yeah yeah that's a really great point i'm really great great really glad that you brought up the kind of relationship example and, and brilliant that you know Marta, your wife is a is a great relationship therapist because you'll you know you'll be aware of these stories all the time and that's not to say that you know us as coaches and therapists talk about our clients all of the time of course but it's just a case of you know, you know, when there are these sort of specific examples and um, it's why as part of my work, you know, when people join Beyond the Mirror Club, we've we have a self-care and attunement disruptor worksheet. Um, and it's so interesting because people that come to work with me and, and, and work with yourself, like you need to know that the work is is about is about doing like worksheets on what's really going on like people are like oh, i'm gonna eat better and exercise more and it's like yeah okay you know we're gonna focus on some of those things but really like people are like oh, i'm not focusing on a habit this week and it's like that's because the issue isn't the fact that you need to fucking eat some protein at every meal bro it's because you've got some unmet needs <laughs> so we need to figure out what they are you know you need to take the time to do this work um, and so the self-care and achievement disruptor sheet is about these different type of psychological and physical needs and going through like 
you know, where are you, where are you, where are you meeting these needs and where are you not? And that can be a really big eye opener, as you said there, that that moment of self discovery to be like, what's really going on here about mm. why I'm getting this kind of uncontrollable urge to binge if things are feeling kind of like, you know, rosy. Let's have some quick fire questions as we hit the kind of final 10 of, of the podcast. Are you, are you feeling good for that? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. So if everything's going well and people are binge free, but then life hits them in the balls and stress ramps up a notch, what's the best way for them to manage that without turning back to binge eating? Build awareness around what it was that caused things or led things to hit the skids. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that I can address this problem by addressing my diet. Be aware of what the actual problem is and address the actual problem. I see a lot of people hitting challenging circumstances and then almost reflexively trying to control their food intake. Mm -hmm. don't, don't do that. What's the original? What's the original problem? And then when it comes to food, don't compensate. Don't get back on the the binge restrict compensation binge roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Go back to normal as quickly as possible. Focus on solutions or potential solutions for the original problem. Great, love that. What would someone have to do if they found themselves creating the opportunities to binge? So let's say, you know, they were like, oh, I'm going to go for a run, but really they're going off to go for a binge. Or they're like, oh, I'm going to work from home today so that I'm, in, I'm not in the office and I can binge. Or, um, you know, even booking time off from work so that they can binge. What, what would someone have to do to kind of break that pattern of, of themselves creating the opportunities? I'd be asking a lot of questions around unmet needs. Like a lot of the stuff that like that, this, the answer to that would be a very holistic, like big picture type situation. Yeah. Um, is it an environmental stress that they're creating an opportunity to get away from? So for example, mm -hmm. someone else I worked with, again, a uh, difficult job, a little bit unfulfilled, a little bit stressful in the job environment. The opportunity to escape that environment to go and have some lunch that would inevitably turn into like a self-medicating style binge is a window of opportunity to find relief from that environment. It's not the fact that they really needed a binge. It's like their options were limited for how to find relief mm. from an environment. So, you know, there could be any number of reasons as to why that's happening. Unmet needs, finding relief from certain situations, escaping certain situations. I don't want to get too specific because then it's easy to say, oh, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. Mm -hmm. But the solution to that particular problem will be about very broadly, what need is that binge fulfilling? Mm -hmm. Like what need are we meeting there? And how might we address that? And sometimes there is just flat out a level of discomfort involved in changing a habit. Period. Yeah. Like we can do all the best things. We can be eating enough. We can be communicating well. We can be leading a fulfilling life and whatever. And the echoes of binge eating might still drive us towards that habit. Sometimes that's it. If we've checked all the other boxes and we're doing well and we're practicing everything else, sometimes breaking the habit is just hard. And that's where we need to lean on more uh, somatic regulation self-talk mm. all those kind of tools for in the moment distress of not following that old pathway yeah yeah brilliant and and you know i'm, I'm really glad that you said that because one of the quick fire questions was going to be you know how to deal with loneliness and having that time to yourself to be like well this is an opportunity i can't pass up yeah but as you've just said there like it's about you've got some work to to really re you know realize what unmet needs are kind of going on um that are causing such a, a large temptation and why even in that moment you would say oh well i'd rather do this than kind of do the work to pull myself out of that yeah. um, uh, one final kind of quick fire if somebody said to you well marcus i've tried unconditional you know i've tried unconditional permission to eat i've tried serving the urge it just it just hasn't worked for me what would you tell them I'd say that urge surfing and unconditional permission are very much surface level skills that exist as the tip of the iceberg on larger amounts of work. So 
it we any number of cliches and metaphors we could bring into play here but urge surfing is a tool um unconditional permission is kind of a a philosophy or a, sometimes a tool whatever depending on which way you want to work at it those things are kind of like the tip of the spear do your best not to draw conclusions about what's possible for you based on your experience of experimenting or trying those things if those things aren't working it's because the foundation of the building needs work great i was letting that sink in with that little pause that's cool man and one thing with what you said about loneliness that's a really big one that really hits me in the heart when someone says loneliness is something that they're struggling with because one of the the most difficult periods of my own journey with binge eating was like just after i moved to the uk i was working with a band doing a lot of touring it was like the year of like the 18 months of my life when i left full-time health and fitness industry work to follow a really cool opportunity to be a full-time guitar player and i went and did that and it was a dream come true and it was an amazing it was also one of the loneliest experiences of my life because it was like three weeks on two weeks off in terms of travel my home base was in a new country and time in between tours i spent a lot of time alone in my apartment i wasn't in one place long enough to really form any kind of like meaningful friendships and it was really isolating and really lonely and it loneliness is hard i just want to acknowledge that loneliness is hard and um finding our way through that is is a real journey yeah yeah good 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 thing to mention there man cool so best places to find yourself probably the podcast yeah the strong not starving podcast strong not starving youtube channel i'm in the middle of updating the strong not starving website um soon i'm going to be called strong not starving on instagram as well historically it's been mk coaching but going through the process of changing the name so if you look for strong not starving on podcasts youtube and the website you'll find me brilliant i'll make sure to share those in the notes marcus thanks so much for your time and your generosity today this has been incredibly valuable i'm sure people will get a lot from it always nice to hang with you man thank you for the invitation